Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to have Sherry on the show with me. Sherry, can you just tell me how you got introduced to the IFB movement and what your introduction was really like to that world? Yes, thank you so much for having me on, Eric. I appreciate this opportunity so much. Um, I was introduced into the IFB at the young, very tender age of 11 years old. I was a very fearful child and um, I was scared to death of dying and going to hell. And they focus in on that. They really um, talk. It's the, the preaching is hellfire and brimstone, right? <laughs> so I went from already being a very fearful, insecure child because we moved a lot when I was younger. Um, and I didn't really ever have a lot of friends that lasted very long, um, just a lot of insecurity in my life. And so I, I was looking for something that was going to help me not be afraid. And um, my parents were, were Catholic. And then they wanted us in a Christian school because the public school was just not working out. And, you know, when you get into that, you get discounts if you're a member of the church and you go to the services faithfully and things like that. So we were all in and um, some of the men of the church after about a month or so of us being there and going to the Christian school stopped by and invited us to some evangelistic meetings. And I was scared to death. They painted this picture of hell (laughs) that um, literally scared me to death. And then I'm also a very empathetic child and they painted the picture of Jesus dying on the cross in such a way Mm. for my sin that I was completely heartbroken that somebody would have to go through that on my behalf. Mm. So it was very much (laughs) fear-based how I got saved. And I really believe I'm saved and my family was saved. Our lives were turned upside down and truly changed from the inside out dramatically from that moment on. Um, And so my, my start was kind of shaky, but I never really, once I knew knew I was saved, I never doubted my salvation. So I, we immediately, like it wasn't too much longer after I got saved at that Baptist church that we moved. And I started going to a Christian school and I was, in junior high and I don't know I think that that second church that we went to was probably it wasn't so old school IFB it was a lot um, more relaxed the pastor was very charismatic but very good you know and it wasn't legalistic so much Um, I really feel like feel like he gave me a really good foundation but I had influences in my life that were very strict. And so I ended up at Fairhaven Baptist College. Okay. And I was the only one, I wanna preface this by saying, I was the only one in my youth group who had already, you know, like I was the only one who didn't wear pants. And I was very careful about what music I listened to, but I don't specifically remember anybody saying I had to do those things. Um, just kind of I was bought just more, into it. Yeah, I I was just more comfortable in skirts and um, it just, what I heard about separation, I kind of tended to be a Pharisee. And that's something I want to start out by saying that I think it's in all our human nature is to be Pharisaical. And so you want to live up to that, you know, and in IFB, that is, that's 
what you're surrounded by. That is the nature of IFB. Sure. Um, and also because I was so insecure, I was a people pleaser. You know, I didn't want to let people down. Um, I didn't want to disappoint people. So I was always going the extra mile to be the good girl. Right. And I was, I was a good girl. Everybody saw me as that. And um, so long story short, I ended up at Fairhaven and it was like running into a brick wall. Um, mm. I did not know anything about that college really before I got there. I felt completely blindsided and um, like it was just false advertising, right. you know, to when I got there, they, they basically are a Christian military school. I lived in Montana at the time. Fairhaven was in Indiana. My parents took me all the way there and they basically had time to drop me off and turn around and go home. Right. So once I was there, I was stuck there. I didn't right. really have a choice. Um, and so I paid my bill, um, a lot of it up front because I had saved up so I wouldn't have to work while I was at college. And if I would have left, I would have lost all of that pretty much. So, um, I was so homesick when I got there and you're not al allowed, nothing is ever allowed to be wrong within the IFB. So everybody's encouraging you, oh, you know, you've got to be strong. You know, this is where God has you and you're not right with the Lord if you're upset about it. <laughs> and if you leave, you're leaving God's will. Right. You know, all these controlling things that, as a people pleaser, I'm, you know, I want to conform. I, I don't want to let people down and I want to be seen as the good girl. And so you're just in this culture where everybody, staff and student alike are enforcing rules and everything within the I felt rules and obeying the rules and obedience and honoring authority. And all of this is like, they're, they have no authority, you know, but they, I mean, but that's what they talk about all the time. And as young, impressionable kids, you don't have the tools to know that that's not right. Even though something in your heart, the Holy Spirit in your heart is telling you, so something is not right about this. You go along with it. You go along to get along. Well, like you said, as a, as a people pleaser too, it's just creating a checklist for you. of like, if I do this, yes. I'm good, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that was easy for me. It was like, if I know what to expect, what I need to do, I can just do it. And then I don't have to guess. But at Fairhaven, you get the rule book the first day and they talk about how that's so misunderstood. But yeah. it's the unwritten rules within the IFB right. that really get you, you know, so there, all of the unwritten rules couldn't be contained in right a book, you know, it's like every time you turn around, somebody saying, Oh, you can't do that. Or you can't feel that way. Or you can't think that, or you can't say that, you know, you have to have, you can't have that attitude. Everything right. is, um, measured by their level of holiness, right. um, which isn't holiness at all. It's just conformity. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was so, so hard. Honestly, the only good thing that came out of that was I met my husband. I mean, and that is all. Right. <laughs> and I didn't make friends, but I actually stayed for three horrible semesters. Right. And with each one, I got more legalistic and more judgmental yeah. and more intolerable. Um, I don't know how my fa family and friends put up with me because I just bought in. Did anybody ever address it? Oh yeah. My sister, she was always calling me on it, you know, saying, right. this is not okay. Who are you? Right. This is not right. I can't believe that you're doing this. You know, right. you've changed so much and it really did put a rift in our relationship because I only have one sister. So we were mm -hmm. very, very, very close. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And my mom and dad, they were just proud of me. You know, they were, they were, very encouraging. They didn't want me to quit. They wanted me to stay and stick it out, but not, not in a bad way, just because they loved me and they knew I could do it. And right. they really didn't know what I was going through, you right. know, didn't have a lot of time to talk and tell them what was going on. Sure. So yeah, um, I met my husband there and it was all, the, it was 
you know, it was, it wasn't anything big that happened to me that I could point to and say that's spiritual abuse. It was all the little things. It was this culture of abuse and control yeah. and coercion and manipulation. So, you know, I got demerits for having a sock between my mattress and the wall and that's nothing, you know, yeah. but when you add up all those little nothings, like your hangers not going the right way or all of your shoes, not neatly put in the drawer, it's just this constant, you know, you get to where you're living your life on eggshells yeah. constantly wondering if, what you're going to get in trouble for next. And you had to have your life planned ahead for so long, at least 24 hours. You, we had to sign up for dinner 24 right. hours in advance. And if we didn't go and we were signed up, we got demerits, you know, just dumb things like that. Um, it's, and, and the way that they shamed people who were overweight. Hmm. And, you know, it just all of it. There was no part of your life that was sacred, that was yours. No. No. Right. So I know you said like it's hard and it's a lot of little things. I think people who have, you know, grown up in that movement understand where you're coming from. If you had to succinctly define cuz cuz spiritual abuse is a very we were talking beforehand, it's a very subjective thing yes. and and it's 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 one of those things like you know when it's happening, but it's hard to mm-hmm. sometimes say like that's what it is. But if you had to like succinctly say like spiritual abuse is this like what would you define it as spiritual abuse is the use of scripture to control manipulate and coerce people to conform um and that that is like the best way that i know how to put Mm -hmm. what has happened to me as a woman within the ifb um i was always a leader in the churches that i've been in and i've seen this the word of God is weaponized and it mm. is it. The Bible says that it, sh- it is sharper than a two edged sword. Right. And if you don't use it skillfully, you are going to wound people badly. Um, right. and, and it is, it's just used as a, a weapon. Right. Now there's a, I'm looking it up right now, but there's a John Calvin quote that I, I always love where it's, um, oh, where is it? I'm going to find it. Oh, truth. It's truth without love is a sword in the hand of a lunatic. And I think there's a lot of times like it's, you know, people take these spiritual principles that could be good things. And then when it becomes this man centered, like, like you said, when they weaponize it to, to achieve their agenda or to model you after them, it gets Mm -hmm. very, very dangerous. And you start using something that is very sharp and dangerous and, you know, start using it incorrectly. Um, yes. w- one thing you'd mentioned beforehand, it's what I wanted to spend the bulk of our conversation talking about um, is, you know, I guess it falls in line with the hurt people, hurt people kind of thing. There's, there's this idea of, you know, you go to a Bible college, you learn in a environment that's very spiritually abusive and those environments produce people who in turn can be very spiritually abusive toward others. Um, you definitely said this was the case with you and your husband in the early years of, you know, kind of ministry and life. Um, how did you, how did you apply those things and start feeling like you were the spiritual abuser as opposed to just being the spiritually abused? Well, you know, that, that's, you said it so well, the people that are spiritual abusers were spiritually abused. They, Mm -hmm. they learned well. You know, they, the people that succeed and graduate and come away from these colleges and are still seen as good, um, have learned how to mimic the people at the top, you know, who are saying, this is how you have to be in order to be a good Christian, but it's all conformity. It's all, um, it's not that inner transformation from the inside out, it's you have to, everything has to look right all the time. Everything right. has to seem like it's all good. And so it's the people that have that image. They're always happy and there's nothing wrong. And, you know, they're going along with the program without having an attitude about it. Um, those are the people that they like. And they, they reinforce that by giving you, you know, praise and saying, wow, you're doing really well. And you're, you're a leader, you're a natural born leader. And they, 
stroke your ego. And <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. um, and this is what you've learned how to do. And my husband and I learned how to do this. And it's not even a deliberate thing. It's not like all of these people have this grand agenda mm -hmm. to be spiritually abusive, you know, and to hurt people. But that's, they don't see what's happened to them as legitimate hurt. Yeah. They haven't been allowed to feel what has happened to them. And, and you know, I have yet to talk to anybody who has um, confronted me about leaving the IFB, hmm. who has not said, I too was hurt. I've been wounded within the church, but right. I'm still there, you know? And I'm like, yeah. yes, but why, why, you know? Right. And, and it is because they have the Christianese down. They have the um, testimony down, the persona of what it is to be a good IFB Christian. Right. And, and if you, if, if they feel like you are not living up to that, they're going to call you on it and say, right. you know, you're, this is not who you are. So um, it isn't, it isn't this agenda. Hmm. It's just something that happens because you reap what you sow. Right. You just do, you reproduce, you reproduce in kind, you know? So right. as Christians, we're out, soul winning all of the time and we're in chapel all of the time and we're at church all of the time and we think everybody else has to do that too you know we're miserable but we yeah. have to pretend that we're not and so we recruit recruit people and it is it's just like what jesus says about the pharisees that you you proselytize these people and you make them 10 times the child of hell that you are yeah. you know it's just exchanging one form of bondage for another one one that was very real for one that's not not real, but it's self-inflicted in a way, and it's inflicted by other people who are supposed to love you. Right. Yeah. So, it, yeah. It's sorry not to cut you off, but that's that's something no. I I think about a lot with the show, and it's where uh, there's a lot of people in the whatever you want to say survivor community or ex IFB community who get frustrated when you won't use the terminology toward everybody within the movement as being like, yes. you know, cult leaders or, you know, mm -hmm. fill in the blank. And one right. of my arguments has been, there's so many I know within that world who are mm -hmm. the most well-intentioned people, yes. like the absolute most well-intentioned people sure. who were just taught by very unhelpful <laughs> methodology or by teachers who, you know, I, I look at, um, you know, I look at certain colleges and churches where, the pastors were legitimately abusive and, yes. and where some of them probably knew that they were, and I say probably definitely took advantage of systems for their own benefit. But mm -hmm. then well-intentioned people who look to them as spiritual mentors are replicating all of their actions without understanding the bad motivations that were behind those. So yes. that's why you mm -hmm. have three generations down the line, a pastor mm -hmm. who's being incredibly spiritually abusive, even though if you ask them what their goal was, it would be like, oh, I want to see their family do better. I want to see them right. be better. I want to see them get yes. stronger, whatever word they want to mm -hmm. use. Right. And instead of helping, they end up doing a lot of damage because they, yes. they don't see it that way. Like you said, right. they, it's all Christianese. It's all, this is what right. we do. We power through. And this is what mm -hmm. the Christian life looks like. It uh, really is. It really is psychological and emotional abuse. And yeah you, unless you are aware of that, that that's what it is, you have no idea, you know, right. and it wasn't until we left the spiritually abusive church in 2014 that we recognized it as abuse. Like mm. we never would have called what we had gone through abuse before that. Um, and it took a while for us to even accept that. We're like, that's, that's a stretch. That's a lot. Yeah. It feels until, almost like, I can't say that. I mean, I don't want to be right. extreme about it, but exactly. You don't want it, to minimize abuse, you right. know, like sexual abuse and things. And so, yeah, um, it, it, that's, that's a hard thing for me because pain is non-quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Trauma is non-quantifiable. And, you know, it's, it's so easy for somebody to say, Oh, you don't understand what abuse is because, it, you were just emotionally or just psychologically abused, but that can be even more insidious than yeah. physical abuse where there are actual, there's actual proof 
that yeah. that happened. Otherwise, they, you're just re-victimized and people say, oh, well, it's just because you, you're not a good enough Christian. Yeah. You know, you don't love the, the Lord enough. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you know, what is, what is that verse that's always flung in our faces? Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing right. shall offend them. Right. Oh, we heard that so much when we left. So yeah, that's, it's just, everything is guilting, mm. you know, and re-victimizing and you don't know until your health breaks down and you can't cope with life anymore. And you realize that you're so broken that you don't feel like you'll ever be fixed again. No. And you don't know why, you know, and then you have to face it and you start healing and you start naming what is actually going on. People gave names to what I had gone through and defined it for me. And that was really when I started to heal. And it's just acknowledging the pain that was inflicted on you and you know, it gives you compassion for your abusers, but also for people that you have hurt or right. that are still in it that you have no, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with you, but they're good people, like you said, and they're just in so much bondage. They mean well. They think that what they are doing is right and everybody else is wrong. And, and they, they are so well-intentioned, but they are being abused and they don't know it. Because right. this form of abuse is so normalized, yeah, you know, and it's not okay. It abuse is abuse and hurt is hurt. And yes, there are different degrees of that, but again, the pain and the trauma are non-quantifiable. It depends on the person and their history yeah. and even the relationship with the Lord to a certain degree right. to, you know, whether or not they're how the extent of their, their trauma. Yeah, no, it's. I like that you say it's non quantifiable, and that's something I found myself doing. Uh, Jesse Byer, I had on the show probably episode 30 or 40, and mm -hmm. you know, she talks about that. You know, trauma, yes. you're, you're, everyone experiences trauma differently, and there's people who yes. experience, you know, severe physical or sexual trauma who it does not affect them. If it doesn't, right. they, they're able to move forward from it. There's people mm -hmm. who, you know, have what on paper, if you put it next to it, would be a minor thing. And mm -hmm. it, it has devastating ramifications on them. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's because everybody processes it differently. People remember mm -hmm. things differently. And, yes. um, and the other person I talked to was, um, I talk about her all the time because it was impactful for me, was talking with Claire Horner, who is mm -hmm. a, um, she specialized in religious trauma, you know, yeah. chatting with her and I downplayed like, was like, well, I don't want to call myself this. And I don't want to say I experienced trauma. And, and she just said, did it affect you? And I said, yes. She said, well, that's trauma. And, and so being able to sit there and like work through it and feel that validation, you know, and especially in, in IFB circles where for so long you're told that, you know, mental illness means you're not being spiritually strong enough or uh -huh. you don't have enough faith or, you know, all of these different things. It's that validation is very, very, very important. Um, yes. So, so tell me a little bit about when you guys recognized maybe for the first time, like, oh, this is not healthy. Like where we're at's not healthy. And um, you mentioned a little bit beforehand, like how you try to fix that from within, but, but what was kind of the process of, first of all, just coming to grips with like, oh, this is not spiritually or mentally healthy for us. Well, it's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint one, one specific time where we just knew it was a series of like the Lord gradually opening our eyes <laughs> because um, you're taught to believe that whenever things aren't going well, it's because you're not right with the Lord. And so you internalize everything and everything is your fault. And um, we, my husband and I just couldn't do Fairhaven anymore. After a while, we were just sick of it. And um, well, I was, so I went home. But Fairhaven is such a calm back. environment. It's so, right. so low stress. <laughs> Right. I was sick all the time. I always had a headache mm -hmm. and I couldn't, I mean, I just, I lost the will to even try in my classes. I literally gave up the beginning of November and I 
like was so close to having straight A's, but I was like, forget it, I'm done. Just stick a fork in me, I'm done. So um, I had actually just really met my husband. I had known him since I got there from a distance, but we actually met and went on our first date in October. And that December I went home and um, he proposed in December and he kissed me and somebody found out. So when, and it was me, I told my friend, <laughs> I shouldn't have. So when he got back, he was campused and that is a horrible, horrible thing. I know it just sounds dumb, but they make it as miserable as possible. And his story is so heartbreaking. Um, I really want him to tell his story because I believe his is the most compelling of the two of us. Um, but he's just not ready to do that yet. Yeah. And I don't blame him. He still has a lot of healing to do. Um, a lot of the pain that he's gone through is very fresh. Right. So he was actually kicked out because mm -hmm. he had too many cut days. And it was at that point that he felt like, you know, I can't do this. Forget it. My best is never going to be good enough because right. it isn't. They always raise the bar, you know, constantly the bar is being raised right. and everything is just unattainable. So he left and we ended up getting married the following July. And the first seven years of our marriage were just hell on earth. I don't, I don't even know how else to describe it. It was so Between miserable. the two of you or because of outside pressure on the marriage? Um, it was mostly between the two of us because he was so broken after that. I mean, he was, we were both called to the ministry, you know, and, right. um, what they teach about marriage at Fairhaven is just, it is horrific, <laughs> you know, the can roles of men and women. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like as yes. far as their teaching? So they really believe that women are lesser, mm. you know, and that we need spiritual authority and leadership of men so if, if we we don't have our own autonomy we don't have any authority of our own um they completely do not acknowledge the priesthood of the believers the holy spirit in the life of a woman um everything is about her being submissive and to her leadership which is her dad and her pastor and then later her husband and her pastor so a woman is to always, always, always be under the leadership of a man because we're prone to deception. This is what they teach. Um, and we are like, we're, my husband was taught from the time he was, I think, very young that if he got into the ministry, his wife was probably going to be his downfall. You know, so he had to be a good leader, a good spiritual leader and keep his wife in line or else she would be the cause of him losing the ministry. And so that is what is taught. That is how marriage is taught. That is how men and, things about men and women are taught is that everything falls on the woman. They tell you that if your husband looks at pornography or cheats on you, it is on you as the woman because you are not giving him enough. Um, if you, the, the wife bears the responsibility. If things are going well, oh, you're doing really, really good. If things are going bad, uh oh, you know, you're not, you're not quite up to par. What do you have to change? Right. And and nothing was ever, ever, ever addressed with the men. Um, it's it's always how submissive are you? Are you honoring him? Are you respecting him? Because that's going to motivate him to love you. So you give him what he needs, and then when you earn it, you will get get what you need, and only then. Well, you, you know, mentioned so things, the weight and everything. Like if you look yeah. a certain way, if you look up the yes. car, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that was a hard thing too. You know, the whole thing of modesty before marriage and then throwing it all off after be, because there's this pressure to keep everything, to keep him from sin, you know, to keep him in line. And so he, he has this pressure to control you, to keep you in line to conform and you have this pressure to keep him in line and conform, you know, and it's just this, you cannot have a happy marriage. If, if you're, there's just that tension over everything being perfect all the time. And everything was not perfect because he wasn't going to church. He wasn't right with God. And so I had to keep up, up appearances. You know, I had to go to church. I had to get the kids ready and I had to be there and I had to be serving and, it was just not okay. It was not right. And um, 
I did buy all in. I was like about six years in, I, I kept thinking, you know, it has to be me. I'm not submissive enough because all of this stuff is going wrong. It has to be me. And so I read Created to Be His Help Me by Der Debbie Pearl and a bunch of other books um, by um, Jack Scop and Cindy Scop and just so many authors. And all of it is do, 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 do. You know, you have to do this. You have to look this way. You have to talk this way. You can, you have to always be sweet. You can't criticize him. Not one negative thought is allowed. And so I, I did, I submitted to him. And for a long time, we attributed us, our, our marriage being restored to me submitting to him because he didn't have anything, to, any resistance to push against anymore. And so he kind of just fell flat on his face. But um, the problem with that is, was he, it wasn't that at all. Really what it was is I was just getting out of the way and I was loving him as he was. And I wasn't trying to change him. I was just kind of letting him have his way on everything. And so naturally, you know, he, he felt indebted to me kind of like, wow, she's trying so hard. She's doing so much. I need to do something, you know? And he did, he did get his heart and life right with the Lord, but it really had nothing to do with my submission, everything to do with me loving him well. Um, and that was just the grace of God in the midst of a really horrible circumstance. So God did redeem it and he got right with the Lord, but immediately we got into a church that was pastored by a Hiles Anderson grad. And, oh my word, <laughs> it was so horrible. You know, a constantly just screaming and hollering and saying, if you don't like it, there's the door, go start your own church, you know, and just offending people right and left right. and just abrasiveness, callousness, nothing loving about it whatsoever. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're looking for is that really strong spiritual leadership when right. we've been away from the Lord, because we feel like that's what we need. We need an authority to tell us what to do and we need to, you know, check, check off all the boxes. No. So, um, we went there and then praise God, the Lord moved us to Wisconsin and we were in an IFB church. So the pastor of that church in Montana with the Hiles grad was very co very overtly abusive. Like okay. he just didn't care about right. anything or anybody, but the church that we ended up in here in Wisconsin was the pastor was very um, covertly abusive and he was a lot more quieter. manipulative. Yes. Okay. And dishonest. <laughs> that is the, the, yeah, that is the way I would describe him. Um, and yeah, that, that whole situation was just so bad because we were all in and we were just so glad to not be being screamed and hollered at anymore, you know, that we were like, wow, this is amazing. God moved us across the country. We're in this amazing church where everybody, we love everybody. Right. We gave of our time, our money. Like we, we, we were there more than we were at home. We mm. lived there. We breathed that church. We loved those people with everything that was in us. And, um, you know, the, th that, the thing, it was never enough, you know, no matter what you did, you never gave enough. Right. You were never there enough. You just weren't ever enough. They kept right. raising the bar, you know? So I was teaching a ladies Bible study and the pastor really saw me as a threat because I would call him on his garbage doctrine, <laughs> you know, during Sunday school, I could tell he was flying by the seat of his pants. He hadn't studied at all. And so he would say something that was blatantly wrong and everybody else would just sit there. So I'd raise my hand and I would say, um, what about this? And then he would feel like he was between a rock and a hard place, you know, and he didn't appreciate that. Um, and I wasn't trying to make him look bad. I was asking honest questions. Um, but again, it's really sad when you're more spiritually mature and more knowledgeable in the Bible and theology than your pastor is, um, especially if you're a woman. And there was a lot of um, like digs about, oh yeah, you should be the pastor or you'd make a really good preacher. 
And I was never allowed to use my spiritual gifts in these churches. Mm -hmm. Never. And I have the gift of prophecy, which is simply being able to encourage and comfort and um, inspire people using the word of God. And, and the, the gifts of God are non-gender specific. It doesn't say that only men can have pastoral gifts like the gift of prophecy, you know, so some women do. And, you know, they're the women who have the gift of prophecy, every single book that I've read about it has said that this gift is the one that women are most frustrated by because yeah. they're not allowed to use them. Yeah. There's no outlet for that. Right? No women are to keep silent, you know? Mm. And if you do speak, it has to be under the authority of a man, you know, your husband and your pastor, they have to know what you're talking about. And, they will call you into their office and, you know, anything that they don't agree with, even if they can't put their finger on it, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, well, I don't like this or whatever. And, you know, it was just, I had, I could only use my spiritual gift as they dictated. I could, I was not free it, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so it, that, it was really frustrating to me. And I think that's when I just gave up. It was in 2014 when we were, you know, realizing this is ridiculous. I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do this anymore. My, my health was failing. And so, yeah. And finally in 2014, 2013 in December, we left. And the only reason we stayed as long as we did was because we had family there sure. and because we felt like, oh, we don't want to leave because we don't want to hurt our kids. And a friend, actually, we counseled with three separate pastors, and all of them said, you are hurting your kids more by staying than you ever could by leaving. You know, you cannot, you know, just keep going along with this, these lies and deceptions that the pastor is, you know, put, he was putting on me. Right. And not take a stand against it and say this is wrong. So the problem he had with me, he said I had a problem with men and with pastoral authority. And at the time I would have denied it, you know, as the day is long because I didn't see it as abuse and I didn't see that I had a problem with that. I just had a problem with abuse of authority, yeah. but I didn't know that that's what it was. Sure. So. Um, so, I mean, obviously you tried to like, you know, kind of raise the alarm while you were inside and like ask questions and things after uh -huh. you left that church, did the two of you try to stay within the IFB still and try to like keep reforming it or try to reform it? Or was it something where you just found yourself like, what do we do now? Yes. So when we left, um, my husband just started preaching to us as a family. And mm. um, because there wasn't a church around here really that we felt comfortable with, but also they believe that their church is the only good one, the only right one. And so right. they, he, this pastor made it a point to say everything bad about every other church in the area, you know, <laughs> during the time that we were there. And so we just had a bad taste in our mouth for all of them. And we also just didn't want to be involved in a church like that anymore. So we just took a step back and kind of acted like we, we just wanted to start with a clean slate and let the Lord really speak to us and say, okay, what do we really believe? And, you know, you want to forget what you think you know and it was like lord just show us show us who you really are and so that was the beginning of our journey out for real yeah and my husband was preaching to us and it was really so so good um and people started hearing about it and more and more people kept joining us in our home until we outgrew it and we had to start renting town halls and so i believe that started in April of 2014 and in October okay. they voted my husband in as, as pastor of the church. Gotcha. So in this other church that we left, we experienced spiritual abuse and in and, and other churches that we had been in. It was always from the pulpit to the pew. Right. Um, but in this church, we were to experience spiritual abuse from the pew to the pulpit hmm. because my husband is a not a really strong um, dictatorial leader right. at all. You know, he wanted to honor what we felt hadn't been honored in us. And that is the Holy Spirit in people, letting the Holy Spirit lead them and say, you know, you need to be here when the church doors are open. You need to do all the right things because you know it's the right thing, not because the pastor's telling you you have to. Right. Um, so, he, you know, like I said, we just crave that 
<laughs> controlling leadership because that's what we're used to. And when we don't have it, people think something is wrong. Right. So we did. Yeah, that was a fresh start for us. Hmm. And we were just trying to um, fix what we felt was wrong with the IFB, not realizing that was a losing battle. Right. Right. Hmm. So I, I mean, I usually end every interview with asking, do you think there's hope for a reform of the movement itself? And it sounds like yeah. you've, you've given a good answer there, but I, I guess I'll ask it this way is like, you know, obviously it takes a lot of time to, uh, you know, reconcile what happened, it takes a long time to like put the pieces together. And I, I think that that's something that never stops. I think we're always trying to figure it out and piece things together from our experiences. Mm-hmm. But um, what's been the most helpful things when it comes to, healing from spiritual abuse like what's been the most beneficial or helpful things that you've done maybe as a family or maybe individually to kind of walk through that that journey Mm -hmm. Uh, that's an easy one it is recognizing who you are in christ knowing who he is and who you are in him and the freedom that you have in him Mm. really you know um the the bible says that where the spirit of the lord is there's liberty And the spirit of the Lord is in us. It's inside of us. And we are free (laughs) to, to follow him, whatever that looks like without somebody from the outside in telling us, judging our conscience, saying, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to believe. This is how you have to think. Um, That was a really hard thing for me because I stepped away from the IFB way before my husband did. And I was just, like, I'm tired of not being able to be who God created me to be. I'm tired right. of it. And I don't care what I lose. I'm going to be true to who I am in Christ because he right. is everything to me. And I, I almost lost my marriage. We, um, I will just very quickly give a summation of the last um, six years. <clears throat> so we started that church and everything went well, sort of. Right. But my husband found himself preaching to an empty church most of the time you know, um, because people just weren't interested unless they were, you know, and yeah. it was their idea to be there, whatever. And, um, I started to recover from a lot of the trauma and I changed so much. I went from this meek and mild, submissive, little quiet person to a very outspoken, used, not afraid to use my spiritual gift woman. I grew up in a very short amount of time into who Christ made me to be because I recognized who he is and who I am in him. And I wasn't afraid to be that. Mm. Um, And people in these churches, they don't like that. You know, you have to conform. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. It's dangerous for a woman to be free. It is dangerous for a woman to to have an independent spirit and to walk with God without the leadership of her husband. And so, you know, uh, the pastor of the church that we left before we started the church that I had a problem with men in authority. And I came to recognize that you're right. I I do. I have a problem with abusive men. I have a problem Mm -hmm. with abusive authority. And I started to speak out on it. And in the process, God gave me my own home-based business that was a platform for me to minister to other women within the IFB, pastors' wives and missionaries' wives specifically, um, who were who felt like they couldn't do anything. They wanted to write Bible study, write write books or um, devotionals or do Bible studies, and their husbands would say no. Right. That this is something that the Holy Spirit was leading them to do, and their husbands would not allow them to do it. Um, and they're like, "What do you do?" And Uh, the perfect IFB wife would say you submit and you let the Lord change their heart, you know, but no, when the Lord tells you to do something, we are to obey God rather than man all the time, every time, no exceptions. And so I began to do that. And the men of the church, of course, rose up and said, you can't do that. And you need to sit down and you need to be quiet and you need to support your husband's ministry. Um, I was called a feminist Jezebel, who needed a spanking and they didn't want me influencing their wives and daughters. Right. All because I was telling them to obey the Lord, to know who they are and to live into that freedom that we have in Christ. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, obviously things are in a better spot now and you guys, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it's tricky. Any kind of, I think we talked about it on a recent episode, but it's any time that there's 
a radical shift among one partner. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's very hard to sync up, you know, those two things. And, you know, I've been married for, for uh, let me see, it's 2020. So it's been like four years now, almost five. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it is, it's even in that short period of time, there's so many things where one person jumps ahead in this area. One person mm-hmm. is struggling, like usually I'm the one in the latter category, but when I, you know, and it's, it is like, it can put a lot of strain when you feel like you're moving at different paces, but it's always awesome when you can, you know, get to a point where you can catch up to each yes. other and, you know, have For common sure. ground. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I think that's awesome. I, what would you give it? I guess I'll end on this question because it's a little bit more tied into this, but what advice would you give to someone who is sitting there and maybe they're in that position where they're recognizing something's not quite healthy or something's not quite mm-hmm. right, but they're, they're fearful to start thinking about it in the terms of being trauma or of being, you know, spiritually abusive. They're, they're in that spot you found yourself in so many years ago now. Mm-hmm. Like, what would you say to them as they're kind of working through that? I would say, don't wait to leave because clarity is found on the other, other side of stepping into that fear of everything. You know, as long as you are there, your judgment, your conscience is going to be clouded by all the outside influences Mm -hmm. from, because it's not just the pastor. It's that peer pressure of people Mm -hmm. saying, this is how you need to be. Yes, it is a culture. It's a culture of abuse and coercion and manipulation and control. Mm -hmm. And you cannot think independently clearly until you're outside of that, because it's like not being able to see the forest for the trees. If you want to see clearly, you need to get yourself out of the picture and look back. You can always go back. Well, most of the time. (laughs) Right. You know, if you you don't burn the bridges. If you can't go back, it's more than likely a sign of (laughs) confirming what you believe. Um, That's that's one of the things, um, another person I name all the time, Stephen Hassan, um, mm-hmm. his, his book combating cult mind control is like incredible, oh, but one so of the good. things, yeah, one of the things he talks about though, is that, um, you know, if you can't ask questions or if you, if mm-hmm. you're, if the love is conditional based on what you're saying or, or explaining. Yep. And the truth is if you, if you do step away for a period of time from a church or organization and you find out like, it's not them, you know, they're not this mm-hmm. way. I was incorrect. If it is truly a healthy organization, they're going to say, oh, welcome back. <laughs> you right. know, it, they're not going to yes. say, now you're on the naughty list because you you stepped away for a while or you took time right. to think for yourself. Um, mm-hmm. Anywhere that questions are limited is a sign of an unhealthy environment. You know, Absolutely. Just you, in general. Yep. You can know who controls you by who you're not allowed to question. Got it. And for women, especially within the IFB, you're not allowed to question your pastor. You're not allowed to question your husband. Right. You know, you, you have to go along with that. And you know what? I have found that my faith is strengthened by my doubts mm. and my questions. That's where I get clarity. That's where I learn why I believe what I believe because of who Jesus is to me in that doubt and in those questions. But if you're in an environment where you can't have that because it's not spiritual enough, you are never, ever, ever going, you're going to be stuck. Right. You're just going to be stuck. Right. No, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you sharing kind of your story and, and mm-hmm. your perspective. And I, I think that, I think it's good to get that clarity as far as like spiritual abuse. I, I, we touch so much on physical abuse and mental yes. abuse. And I think mental abuse and spiritual abuse and sexual abuse are often all three components of yes. every situation. But I, I just, yeah. I think it was cool to really dive into this. I think your definition of spiritual abuse was, was spot on. I think that, I think when you're using scripture in a weaponized way or any worldview in a weaponized way to make someone do what you want them to do, I think you put yourself in a very precarious position. You put them in a a precarious position as well. But um, but yeah, but thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Eric. Awesome. Okay. So you were, you were saying just when we stopped recording, but I thought this was good, but um, you were saying that, uh, you know, how women are often abused within the IFB. Can you just say that, that quote one more time? Sure. Yes. So a lot of times it seems like women are 
are singled out and they're more abused than men, you know, and, and in a way they are, you know, there's men are free to be independent, to follow the Holy Spirit, to do all the things and women are not, but men are taught within the IFB that in order to be a good man, in order to be truly a, a man, they have to make everybody else fall in line. They yeah. are basically taught, they are abused and they are taught to abuse women and children or their congregations or whoever in order to be considered a good leader, a good spiritual leader. So in my husband's case, you know, he was my spiritual leader, but he was also responsible for this entire church. Yeah. And he said that so many, so many times he felt like he was just at sea. You know, he was the captain of the ship and he had no motor, no, no, mm. there's no, there's nothing. He's just out at sea and he's supposed to lead all these people to shore and he's got nothing, you know, because he isn't, I don't know. He can't pull it out of thin air. I don't know, but right. he just did not feel adequate as a spiritual leader of our home or of the church because of what the idea of that is supposed to look like within the IFB. And yeah. it's just demoralizing. It's not, it's not, it is so incredibly harmful for men. And of course, women, the women who have to live with them. Right. Yeah. It's, it's creating abusers to, basically abuse and then you have women who are being yes. abused and and again it goes back to what we we're talking about earlier is that then you have guys who are well-intentioned trying to be good husbands who are doing things that make them bad husbands or bad right. parents and yes. it's a very it's, it's a very very slippery slope um it really is which is very ifb of me to say it's slippery slope but <laughs> but um but it is now I, I just wanted to i just wanted to get that because i think that's so important is that men are taught to be abusive and it's just disguised as spirituality. I thought that was a good point. So, yes. but um, yeah, I definitely need to get your, I definitely need to get, get your husband on. Obviously, whenever he's ready, um, mm -hmm. I'd love to. Um, but I know it's, it's a lot to like sit down and talk through and like just mm -hmm. reopen that door. Um, you know, yeah. so, so yeah, anytime, just okay. let me know. And I'd love to, love okay. to have him on. So. That sounds good. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.